pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please call the roll. Councilmember Francisco? Here. Hodgkiss? Here. House? Here. Murillo? Here. Rouse? Here. White? Mayor Schneider? Here. Actually, um, Mr. White won't be here, so Mr. Francisco, if you want to, I mean, um, Mr. Hotchkiss, if you want to move over one, you're welcome to. Are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, there's uh, two changes. Um, first, we would recommend that you take item six, the fire chief appointment, after public comment and before consent calendar that we adjourn for a short closed session, then come back and report out. And um, if that's okay with the council, so that'd be after public comment. And then on item number eight is also a closed session item regarding litigation. And I just spoke with the city attorney and we'd like to pull that and bring it back at a, a subsequent meeting. Okay. I think we need a motion to move item six up. Is there a motion to do so? Move to move item six up. Back. Is there a second? Second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we have public comment. We have two minutes here at the podium. I have a few speaker slips. We'll start with Leonicio um, Martins, who will be followed by Sheila Cushman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, first, I'd like to, if it's possible, Okay, I'm sure everybody is familiar to my intention here today. I'm in support of gun control. <clears throat> I'm here today as a father. I live in Santa Barbara for 33 years, and I'm a voter too. I vote most for most of the members here today, I vote for. And today, I ask you a favor. I know it's my understanding that Santa Barbara City Council members believe that's not a city council job to wait in, in a matter over which has no control. I disagree. The capacity of lower legislatures to run opinions on matters of vital national wide importance up to the chain of command is a company that helped democracy. <clears throat> in the wake of the murders of 24 graders and seven daughters in Newtown, there is a new national issue for the city council to officially wait in on common sense of gun law. I urge, I urge the city council to consider a resolution supporting Senator Diana Feinstein gun law bill. She has introduced Congress in January 24, 2013. The city council's resolution should also urge support for the President Obama's gun violence prevention proposal to Congress, which cover everything from mental health, gun safety, to block the most deadly firearms from making it to the market. Need to wind up, please. I hope the city, Santa Barbara's city council, you take action by considering resolution supporting Senator Fenstein and President Obama common sense gun law in order to better protect their children and communities from tragic measures like the one in Newton Connect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sheila Cushman will be followed by Nancy Tunnell. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council Members. It's great to see you. Um, I came today just to congratulate you on the tremendous effort for getting those parking garages. Our entire board had our fingers and toes crossed the entire time, so excellent job on that. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Jim Armstrong and Paul Casey and Steve Wiley for working closely with our attorney to get the rest of those properties, and particularly the depot property. Um, we appreciate being part of the team and part of the effort that makes that happen. 
Um, I also wanted to thank each and every one of you for being such enthusiastic and strong supporters of our project. It means a lot to us, believe me. Um, as you know, we've made tremendous progress. We've raised a quarter of our campaign goal just from our board. We have uh, thousands of children and families waiting for the doors to open, and now we just need to secure the property and get our lease. So I hope you'll do all you can to expedite that so we can get going. Thank you. Mr. House has a question. Uh, Ms. And really, this should Ms. be Ms. part of the discussion about the RDA, but we'll let you ask the question. Just a, just a real quick question. If somebody wants to know more about the Children's Museum or to contribute or something, how would they reach you? Uh, they could go to our website and they can contribute online or contact me, www.childrensmuseumsb.org. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thank you. Nancy Tunnel will be followed by Patrick Matthew Ortiz. Now, who really runs the sustainability movement? I'm sure it won't surprise you to hear among the leaders are Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, and Conservation International. Besides their independent programs, they work directly with the United Nations, and our government has put together a bipartisan group in Congress called the International Conservation Caucus Foundation to help them, their partners, reach their goals and agendas. We assume these groups are truly what their facades imply, but any thinking person would agree that to really know what these groups are about, you need to know who runs them. So so let's look at the leadership and boards of directors, easily accessible information. You, um, you wouldn't recognize many names, but you will certainly know the corporations they represent. Let's start with the president and CEO of Nature Conservancy, who left a major managerial post. It's Goldman Sachs for the position. His expertise, environmental markets. He was advised by his old boss and ex-president and CEO of Nature Conservancy, Henry Hank Paulson, to take the job. A few more names you will recognize. Bank of America, Cargill, Unilever, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Shell, Hewlett Packard, Duke Energy, BP, Google, Walmart, and on and on. And these aren't second stringers. You have Sam Walton, the grandson representing Walmart, Charles Holliday from Bank of America. So the sustainability movement is being run by institutions that have created the problems the sustainability movement is supposed to solve. And you can hear Jason Clay of World Wildlife Fund on a TED Talk explaining why everything should be turned over to the biggest corporations because, according to him, only the very biggest have the resources to reach sustainability before <gasps> it's too late. And so when you start stuffing Agenda 21 down our throats again, at least you'll know who's behind it. Patrick Matthew Ortiz will be followed by Max Golding. I'd like to raise a topic about the satanic cult in Santa Barbara and a lack of having authentic and real religious services. And I've, always, I've been told that Cantor Childs has been seen in the Druid area up in Mountain Drive with the Druids. And uh, there's, they have a strange covenant uh, characteristics and they're loud threats and they want people to give them things in order to free them from the oppression of them in this community. And uh, I was one of these people that was uh, defamated from education because I, my uh, financial aid was embezzled at one time when I tried to go to school at City College. And I'm also um, uh, having some anti-Semitic oppression in my living conditions. I had to bunker in with lock boxes and a lot of things to keep people from poisoning my food. There's been a lot of poison used on, on the youth groups and people. And uh, they've had to... Uh, uh, put earrings on their facial areas and things and tattoos in order to be accepted in the community and in the education system. And uh, there's uh, a lot of false accusations about religious people and religious leaders in the community, if there's any, to divert the people from safety. And a lot of these people are illiterate people that are just barely learning English. And uh, I'd like to get some library books in the library and... Um, <clears throat> I'd like to get them guarded with cameras and security guards so that they can learn the Talmud and the Mishnah and the Torah and uh, so people could have some laws to solve the problems in the world so we could have government services and health care uh, legally in this community, you know, without this type of favoritism like, for people that are, that are either pagan or within the cult or not, you know. Uh, this may require some type of special government supervision in the area. 
And Time's up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Max Golding. And is there Kathy Swift here? Yeah, I know. I just want to make sure you're in the room. And Colin, uh, is it Colin? Okay, so you have four minutes. Hello, Mayor, um, City Council members. Um, Mayor Schneider, I emailed you this letter uh, one or two weeks ago. Um, it's the letter this uh, Seattle City Mayor Mike McGuinn sent to the uh, City Employees Retirement System Board, um, urging them to divest um, all, any investments in the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> I write to you today to ask that you refrain from future investments in fossil fuel companies and begin the process of divesting our pension portfolio from those companies. I recognize that this process may require a thorough evaluation of the portfolio's performance, assets, and investment strategies. City staff stand ready to assist you in this work. Climate change is one of the most important challenges we currently face as a city and as a society. I would say as a species. We have watched in recent weeks as weather influenced by climate change has caused significant damage and financial losses to cities and states on the East Coast. The projections suggest that the problems could get much worse. According to Bill McKibben and 350.org, fossil fuel corporations now have 2,795 gigatons of carbon dioxide in their reserves, five times the amount considered safe to avoid catastrophic climate change. I believe that Seattle, this could be Santa Barbara, ought to discourage these companies from extracting that fossil fuel and divesting Divesting the pension fund from these companies is one way we can do that. The city's cash pool is not currently invested in fossil fuel companies, and I already directed that we refrain from doing so in the future. In addition, I am asking the Deferred Compensation Plan Committee, whatever would be the equivalent in Santa Barbara City, to develop options for city employees to allow them to move their investments out of fossil fuel companies if desired, and to offer fossil fuel free investment choices to them refrain from future investments in fossil fuel. The City of Seattle's finance director informs me that two of the, si the system's top ten investments are ExxonMobil and Chevron. The pension system has currently $17.6 million invested within these two firms, which represents roughly 0.9% of the system's $1.9 billion in assets. I understand that it is likely the system has investments in other fossil fuel related entities as well, there is a clear economic argument for divestment and moral argument as well. While fossil fuel companies do generate a return on our investment, Seattle will suffer greater, greater economic and financial losses from the impact of unchecked climate change. Our infrastructure, our businesses, and our communities would face greater risk of damages and losses due to turbulent weather that climate change causes. As a waterfront city, hmm, Several of our neighborhoods and industrial districts are at risk if climate change causes a significant rise in sea level. I believe that Seattle's pension funds should be invested in companies that can provide a good return on our investment without putting our city and our future at risk. I am ready to work with the City Council and the Pension Board to make this happen. Sincerely, Mike McGuinn, the Mayor of Seattle. Um, and I printed out a whole bunch of copies, so um, one, two, Give three. Give that to the clerk four, right five, there. Six. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. For all the hard work you all do. Here. Okay, that concludes public comment. We'll wait till you give that to the clerk. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, um, if you can read item number six. Item six, closed session to consider fire chief appointment. Okay, so we're going to move to closed session. This should not take too long, and then we'll be right back out. So stay tuned. Living wage, it's your right. The city of Santa Barbara has a living wage ordinance. Firms providing services to the City of Santa Barbara must pay living wages to their employees working on city contracts. Information on the Living Wage Program can be found on the City of Santa Barbara's website, santabarbaraca.gov, or by calling 564-5349. Living Wage, it's your right. Notice anything?
different about this neighborhood? Yeah, it looks like someone actually cares about it. There's no graffiti, no litter. I don't even see a weed. Exactly. Why isn't our neighborhood like this? <laughs> hey, guys, great to see you. Come on in. Hey! So on the walk over, we noticed that your entire block looks really great, like really cared for. How is it that our block's only three streets away and it looks all run down and trashed? Well, we joined the Looking Good Santa Barbara's Adopt-A-Block program. We're committed to keeping our streets clean and free of litter and graffiti. The city provides us free supplies, including a work vest, gloves, trash bags, and a graffiti removal kit. And it's time we get to spend together doing something good for our community. Wow! Sign us up. Hi there, what's shaking? Been expecting me? Is this a shirt? No. Shame. What are you doing? Just checking to see how prepared you are. Any straps holding this down? No. Don't wait until disaster comes knocking. Be aware. Be prepared. It's time to come in. Session. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and members of the council, um, I'm happy to report that in the closed session, the city council um, unanimously approved my appointment of Chief Pat, or uh, Division Chief Pat Macro to be our new fire chief. Congratulations, Chief. You're welcome to come on up if you'd like to say anything. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Schneier, Council Members, Mr. Armstrong. Um, thank you for this opportunity to serve as a fire chief for the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department. Um, I look forward to working with you and the rest of the city's management team on the issues that are facing um, Santa Barbara, not only in fire, but on the larger issues as we move into the next century. Um, in, the, in the past several weeks, as this process moved along, there were a couple things that occurred that really brought home why this thing is so important to me. Uh, the first is a response to several uh, recent fires. And it's, 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 a, it's been in a different role f for me to be standing back a lot further and, and watching other people do things that I'm used to participating in. And I was just so impressed on a number of occasions, most recently on TV Hill, but before that in Chapala at the Del, old Del Pozo uh, building, on just the calmness and the professionalism and, and just, the, just that, just how calmly they went about everything, how good it looked to me. I mean, for people that aren't in the prof profession, it, it you know, probably looks better <laughs> than it should sometimes, but for, for somebody that, when you're looking at something that you know really well and going, God, this, they're doing this just going textbook. I wish I had a film of this. And, and it's, it was something that really was very impressive to me. Um, the second was uh, we're in the process of hiring some new firefighters. And um, we're working with our employees, we had a fully a third of our department involved in way, one way or another over several months in designing the test and vetting the test and looking at it over and over again. And it seemed at some point like it was just too big of a a task, and it's, it's it's like they say about eating an elephant, you just do it one bite at a time, and it finally just got down to um, this group of uh, nine or ten people that we interviewed a couple of weeks ago. And I was just struck by the quality of the people that want to come work here. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, the character and the professionalism, once again, and the resumes that they're bringing with them. I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine competing with these people when I started, you know, 30, 30 years ago. Um, the third is that I recently attended the Chief Demisio's retirement ceremony, and it was so great to see the amount of people that were there from the community and, and from the city, but also people that had been Santa Barbara firemen when I first got on the job, and people that had been re retired for, you know, 20, 25 years or so that were real mentors to a lot of us that were in that room. And to see, still see the sense of belonging to something that was very important to them. Um, and in, in the past week, on a much sadder note, to see those same people and generations of firefighters that work here now 
on the in the in critical care unit of Cottage Hospital visiting one of our own who's in very grave condition. But that mixture of people that are in their early 20s with people that are in their 70s, they're all there. We're all part of this thing. And that's it's an extraordinary thing to be a part of. It's just really an extraordinary thing. And um, finally, I want to thank my wife, Bonnie, and my uh, children, Darcy, uh, Brendan and Duffy, and the rest of my extended family. Um, there isn't anything I can say here that's adequate enough for them. But anyway, thank you again for this extraordinary chance to serve, and we'll be seeing you. Thank you, Thank you very much. We appreciate your leadership and look forward. Okay, moving on to the consent calendar, and there's some items to read. Item three, resolution authorizing execution of grant agreement in the amount of $300,000 with the State Coastal Conservancy for construction of the Mission Creek Fish Passage Project, Lower Caltrans Channel, recommending that council adopt by reading of title only. A resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara authorizing the Parks and Recreation Director or designee to negotiate and execute an agreement and any amendments for a grant in the amount of $300,000 from the State Coastal Conservancy for the Mission Creek Fish Passage Project, Lower Caltrans Channel. Great, without further objection, we'll wait for further reading. Any items to take off or is there a motion to approve the consent calendar. Move the consent calendar. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. All right. Thank you. Report from the Finance Committee, Mr. Francisco. Madam Mayor, the Finance Committee met today and heard with breathless anticipation the quarterly investment report for the quarter ended December 31st. And I'm here to report all as well. It's good because we just voted on it. Um, that's good. Report from the Ordinance Committee, Mr. House. Yes, Mr. Hotchkiss, Mr. Rouse and I met today uh, for a second time and uh, forwarded the uh, Municipal Code amendments for uh, implementation of our non-residential growth management program on the City Council. And so we'll be getting that, I believe, in the first part of March, March 5th, here at City Council to consider. Okay. Thank you. Item number five. Transfer of real property from the successor agency to the former redevelopment agency of the City of Santa Barbara to the City of Santa Barbara, recommending A, that the successor agency adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the successor agency to the redevelopment agency of the City of Santa Barbara, conveying and assigning for public parking and all related purposes, all right, title, and interest to the governmental purpose real property described herein, owned by the successor agency to the former redevelopment agency of the City of Santa Barbara, to the City of Santa Barbara, and authorizing the executive director to execute such agreements and related documents as necessary to effectuate such transfer of real property interest to the City of Santa Barbara and B, that Council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara accepting and assuming for public parking and all related purposes, all right, title, and interest to the governmental purpose real property described herein, owned by the successor agency to the former redevelopment agency of the City of Santa Barbara to the City of Santa Barbara, and authorizing the city administrator to execute such agreements and related documents as necessary to effectuate such transfer of real property interests to the city of Santa Barbara. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. I'm happy to report for the first time in over a year that we've got good news with regards to the dissolution of the redevelopment agency. And it's kind of sad that good news is that we didn't lose something. Uh, but we take what we can get. We're here to transfer the parking lots uh, to the city of Santa Barbara after a lot of trepidation and ups and downs uh, over the last few months. And so I wanted to just take a little bit of time to kind of go through the chronology of events and then also just kind of clarify all of the assets of the redevelopment agency and where they stand in the disposition process and being transferred to the city and what remains to be done as well. So we pick up in September of 2012. We're in the middle of the redevelopment dissolution process where we're following the requirements of the state as we go through that. And they passed legislation over the summer that kind of clarified this whole unwinding. And it, it allowed a path to transfer governmental assets to the city of Santa Barbara and into the cities of the different redevelopment agencies. And so we went pretty quickly 
uh, to our local oversight board and ask them to transfer the parking lots and some other uh, properties as governmental assets to the city of Santa Barbara. The oversight board approved that unanimously and we're very supportive of that and so we moved right along and we sent that information up to the State Department of Finance who essentially has veto power over actions of the oversight board. So then on November 16th of last year, we got a letter from the Department of Finance just a matter of days before we were before the City Council to complete the action, uh, denying our request on the parking lots, uh, including the railroad depot and the parking lots surrounding the depot and a very small uh, property on Bath Street next to Mission Creek. Uh, we were quite surprised by that uh, letter from the state. They said essentially parking lots are governmental purpose only if they park only government employees. Uh, we thought that was a unique way of interpreting what is a governmental purpose, uh, but we were dealt with that letter. At the time, though, the state did approve the transfer of other properties that we had requested, including Chase Palm Park and the Ortega Water Treatment Plant. And so the city council moved ahead with uh, transferring those two parcels uh, to the city of Santa Barbara. So then in November 27th, we quickly turned around and submitted additional information and, and requested a meeting with the Department of Finance. This was a little unique. There wasn't really a process for the state about how you kind of protest a letter as it dealt with property. We were one of the first agencies to be going through this purpose and uh, process and kind of pursuing this governmental transfer process. And in conversations with the State Department of Finance, they said, well, why don't you go ahead and set us a letter uh, and we'll see about kind of fitting, fitting you in somehow. And so we did that. And so we wrote a letter. It was a very, uh, I'll say, a, a good five-page letter put together by uh, Steve Wiley, our city attorney, and Sarah Connect from the attorney's office, who did really great work. Uh, Brian Bossy helped out. We had help from Browning Allen and, and Mr. Armstrong and myself. And so we put together a, a letter that we thought laid out a number of different reasons why we felt that the parking lots were governmental assets. And we requested a meeting with the Department of Finance. They granted that meeting and said, come up here on December 19th. And so we flew up with the mayor. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Wiley, and myself flew up and met with the Department of Finance. Assemblymember Williams and his chief of staff attended that meeting with us, which we really appreciated and which I think was effective. Uh, staff from uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's office also attended, as well as the attorney representing the Children's Museum. So I think we put on a good show of why this was important to the city, and we made our arguments again in person. Uh, I think as I reported out at the time, they held their cards pretty close to the chest and said thank you. Uh, and we said, well, when will we hear from you? And they said, maybe about a month. And so we went away, and we really didn't know which way they were going to go. Then on January 22nd, 2013, we got a letter back from the Department of Finance, and they revised their response, and they approved the transfer of the parking lots. So they did a 180-degree turn, which we were very happy with. And in many ways, we're kind of surprised that they uh, found in our favor so quickly. And so that was a, a big sigh of relief, and we were very thankful on it. They did not allow the transfer of the railroad depot parking lots in the Bath Street property at this time. Uh, and in the letter and also conversations that Mr. Armstrong had with the department, uh, they really kind of gave us positive guidance, though, and gave us good hope that if we follow through a process, th that those two properties will also likely to be found governmental assets and that because of some unique circumstances I'll go to in a second, that the request was maybe premature. It wasn't that they disagreed with the request, but that this wasn't the right forum to, to make that request. So what I want to go through now is kind of where the disposition stands with all the properties that the redevelopment agency had been dealing with. So what we have previously approved and half transferred by action of the city council back to the city is the Chase Palm Park expansion, the Ortega water treatment plant, and all the housing assets. Just wanted to remember that the law allowed us to transfer all the affordable housing assets back to the city, and we've already taken that step uh, and have done so. What's approved for action today uh, for you to take through adoption of the resolution is uh, approving the parking lots. And I just quickly just wanted to go through the parking lots that are involved. Uh, it was the Granada Garage. It was lots 2 and 10 that kind of surround Paseo Nuevo. Lot 2 is on Cannon Perdido, and lot 10 is on Ortega Street. Uh, lot 11 and lot 12, which are the surface lots off of Ana Kappa and at State and Gutierrez. Uh, the Garden Street lot down in Cabrillo Boulevard was involved in this as well, what uh, many of us know as the Pony lot from years gone by. Uh, the Coda commuter lot and the Carrillo Street commuter lot. Uh, a Helena Street lot, which is next to where Fest Parker's Youth Hostel is uh, going to be opening up. And then the Mason Street lot is just some surface parking down around the railroad tracks, kind of in the funk zone that came about with, with the realignment of Garden Street. Uh, so those lots uh, were at risk. 
and those are the lots that we're here today to happily uh, recommend that you transfer back to the city. What remains to be dealt with that uh, the state did not approve yet uh, are a number of properties. And let me just step back and say how we deal with these properties going forward now is we have to do a property management plan. It's what the law calls for. And you have to do a property management plan that kind of calls out each parcel, does a historical analysis of when you got it, how much it might be worth, what you bought it for, uh, what its use was going to be, what its uh, capacity for reuse might be. And you have to put a plan together and you have to talk about what you propose to do with that lot. Do you propose to transfer for to the city? Do you propose that it's going to be used for a redevelopment project, for a development project essentially? Do you propose to sell it off if you don't have a use for it? And so we're going to have to put that plan together for these remaining parcels. And the first group of those uh, properties that we're going to have to deal with are the railroad depot area, which includes, I believe, four parcels that encompass the Children's Museum uh, site and uh, project that they already have planning commission approval for. <laughs> So we will have to deal with those properties as part of the uh, property management plan, and our recommendation will be transfer that to the city. We've got a development project that's approved with the Children's Museum. In concept, we've agreed in an MOU to a dollar a year lease for 50 years with the Children's Museum. And the Oversight Board has already approved that approach, which we tried getting through the governmental asset. So we're hoping that the Oversight Board will be supportive of that and that the Department of Finance will then respect that decision of the Oversight Board but we have to go through that process for the Children's Museum. The remaining railroad depot and those surrounding parking lots will have to put into the property management plan as well as the Frisch Enterprise lot, the Enterprise Fish Company lot uh, down there. We think that from talking to the Department of Finance that if we can show that the depot and the surrounding parking lots are used for a transportation purpose, that they'll find those to be a uh, governmental purpose. Why they didn't transfer them at this point is they said because the Children's Museum was proposed kind of in those clump of properties, that's a proposed development project and that had to be dealt with in the property management plan and that's why we couldn't just approve transferring all those as government assets. But if you go through this process with the property management plan, we think you have a good argument to make and we'll be able to approve it at that time. So that's kind of their wink and the nod they're giving to us. We won't take anything for granted. We'll put together a real solid package, but we're feeling pretty good today based upon the information they've given us. And then the three other lots that we need to deal with are the Bath Street lot. Uh, just to orient you really quickly, this is at Bath and Mission Creek. The properties were acquired to help facilitate the bridge project uh, there. I think it's the Ortega Bridge that it's at. And this is a very small remnant parcel of it that we always identified to be a, a neighborhood park. Uh, the Oversight Board has actually approved the funding to construct the park later this summer. And what they're essentially saying is, look, it's not a park now, so you can't transfer it as a governmental purpose. But once it becomes a park, you can then ask for it to be transferred as a governmental purpose. So go do the project, make it a park, and then you can transfer it. Uh, so that's what we'll do. It's like 0 0.08 of an acre with setbacks from the street and from Mission Creek that make it undevelopable. So it's really a worthless piece of property out on the market. So we're not expecting any, any feedback from the oversight board to go ahead and make this into the neighborhood park that we want it to be. And then the two remaining parcels are parcels that we've always figured we were going to have to sell off based upon the law that was passed. This, the Calle Cesar Chavez lot, a uh, little over two acres down in the waterfront industrial area. The redevelopment agency purchased it as an opportunity purchase about 10 years ago. Uh, we never quite identified a project and didn't do anything with it. And so the law makes it pretty clear that then you need to go sell that asset and divvy up the proceeds to the different taxing entities. And we're prepared to do so. We really don't have any other argument uh, to, to go with that. And then Paseo Nuevo, the city actually owns uh, some of the land under Paseo Nuevo, has a long-term operating lease and covenant with Paseo Nuevo um, that still has, I think, 50 or 60 more years to run. We don't know what kind of value that will have, if any. Perhaps the, the owner of Paseo Nuevo will be the only interested party in, in pursuing that. But at this point, our thought process is, which we'll put into the property management plan, is to go ahead and sell that off as an asset and just kind of dispose of it rather than having a complicated argument with the Oversight Board and the State Department of Finance about otherwise. Um, and who knows, maybe the city will be interested in purchasing it at a low price just to kind of maintain some interest there if the uh, existing property owner is not interested. We'll have to play that out. So that kind of summarizes where we're at with all the different properties. We're very happy to be here and to resolve this parking garage issue because it was uh, a big, ugly thing hanging over our heads. 
Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We have some lights on. I don't see any speaker slips. I think if the ruling was the other way, this house would be packed. Um, we got a lot of uh, um, emails and kudos out and out and about town, so I know that. Ms. Murillo? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Congratulations, Mr. Casey, to you and your staff for making this happen for the city and its residents. Um, so the Bath Street parcel is wh what is envisioned. Uh, has there been any preliminary park design? Just it looks like it would. If I'm thinking of that little corner, it might take a couple of benches. Or what, what's the plan? Do you know? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Parks Department has actually put together a little plan. Um, it really is little. It's a tiny parcel, and, and I don't know if you can see this, but they're thinking of a very small play structure. Uh, oh. to kind of be able to fit into the site, and then wood chips on the bottom and a little fencing. It really is about as basic and rudimentary as you can get, and yet will be a nice asset for that neighborhood that is really low on park space and open space and will give a little relief. Thank you. I was, I was going to make that point. Um, and then what is the acreage on the Calle Cesar Chavez um, area? Madam Mayor, if I remember, Councilman Murillo, it's about 2.4 acres, I believe, uh, in that ballpark. It's a little oddly shaped. It goes from Quarantina over to Calle Cesar Chavez. It's got uh, this kind of wet, degraded wetland over next to the railroad tracks, and so its uh, usable area is somewhat questionable. But it's good prime M1 industrial land uh, down in the industrial zone, so I think it'll have value. So if I'm driving down Calle Cesar Chavez towards the ocean, it's on the left? It's on the left, and it's okay. the last parcels before you hit the railroad track. Oh, okay. And okay. we've used it for construction staging area for city projects, so occasionally you've seen you know, storage of large sewer pipes and other types of materials <coughs> and such. Uh, but other than that, it's, it's essentially vacant land at this point. Thank you. Mr. House? Uh, just on that, on that one, uh, uh, Caius Cesar Chavez, and that, uh, Cacique, as a street on the lines on a map continues on over to um, to Calle Cesar Chavez. It's, a, it, it's there. I mean, it was there long before we acquired this property or had the opportunity to do it. And um, a question is for Mr. Wiley. I mean, the city has had a, effectively a street on maps there, not developed, but for years since streets were laid out. And it was our vision uh, in, in acquiring that property to continue. In fact, it was one of the things that the community discussed and raised as a high priority back in the early 90s. Um, and then the city continued to follow through on the idea of connecting that for pedestrian access through, for the workers, for the people utilizing the waterfront resources. And so it's been articulated outside of the context of the redevelopment agency for a long time. Um, doesn't the city have some kind of um, prescriptive right to that or use of it because I mean it is a city street after all that just never got paved. Madam Mayor, Councilmember House, uh, I think generally you're correct. There, there were a lot of what we called city paper streets down in that area. Um, but my recollection is that that portion of Cacique was actually abandoned um, many years ago. I know we had litigation about 20 years ago, more towards the uh, the, the treatment plant and uh, Yananali and South Sapuetis from property owners, and there was a judicial determination that those paper streets that dated from the 1910s and 1920s had actually never been officially uh, validated or confirmed as city streets. They had been shown on maps, but they were never officially accepted by the city council. And I believe that's the status of that particular portion of Cacique Street. Although I do recall when we acquired this property from uh, Marburg, who had just acquired it from Southern Pacific, I think it was Southern Pacific at the time, that Public Works looked into whether we should do a project of extending Cacique mm -hmm. Street. And it's my recollection that they, opted, they said that it really wasn't necessary for proper traffic circulation. Uh, Mr. Wiley, I, I bring it up today knowing that we're not taking action on that particular parcel, but um, I would ask that we look again and just really, uh, because again, I was part of the public process at that time and we got pretty seriously, as you remember, um, engaged in um, the circulation, not specifically for motor vehicles, but clearly for pedestrian access that's utilized uh, you know, for workers and for people uh, from the east side. And it was part of the vision of continuing the Cacique undercrossing from the Lower East Side, uh, past the new fire station all the way across their post office and all the rest. 
that was well articulated in the public process that that would eventually be connected in one way or another. And whether, I don't know what, it sounds like there is not a legal, you know, right to do this, but maybe there is. I just, I just would like us to look again because it could be to our benefit to sell it, of course. It might be we shouldn't tell them about the turtles, but, you know. <laughs> There's, certainly there's, there could be a real benefit to the city to do that, but I also wonder if um, that vision isn't something we would want to pursue if we ever had the opportunity. And then lastly, um, uh, I just want to say thank you so very much, uh, in particular with regards to the Children's Museum. It sounds like that's still, though, a little perilous. I mean, the way that that gets packaged together, you know, the idea that there's a dollar, whatever it is, lease kind of arrangement, um, I understood from the staff report or something, I began to see that there's some really complexities to that. So are, is it your idea then to make it a whole, that this is one whole package, if you will, of the, the parcels and their uses and they all hang together, including the Children's Museum and the Railroad Depot and the parking lots? Madam Mayor and Councilmember House, our, our approach is to present them with a comprehensive property management plan that contains all the parcels, but with kind of different arguments and supporting documents for the different components. And we see, though, lumping the Children's Museum together as encompassing the four parcels that the Children's Museum property and project sits on. Uh, and relying on the fact that we have an approved Planning Commission approval for a project, that the Oversight Board had previously recommended its transfer to the city, that we have a memorandum of understanding uh, between the Council and the Children's Museum for a long-term lease at a dollar a year, and, and use that kind of historical precedence as the reason for moving forward. And with the rest of the taxing entities kind of agreeing to that and recommending to that, our hope then is that the state would approve that transfer as well. Uh, and then separately you deal with the other remaining properties as well. Oh, I see. So it's not like bundling all those others together, but there's four parcels that, that comprise that, that ground, that land. Correct. I see. It's interesting. And, and the, the other option would be something more like at a, quote, market rate to, to transfer ownership to the Children's Museum. And then perhaps on the other side, the city could make some arrangement to to reverse that compensation or something like that? Yeah, the, the other option that, that you could consider with the Children's Museum if they were interested, which I believe they're not, they had a, a board meeting this morning and decided they wanted to pursue kind of the, the previous approach of doing the long-term lease, is you could uh, have the oversight board and the city recommend through the property management plan that we sell off the parcel and that the Children's Museum then steps up and purchases it. I think their disinterest in that is that that takes more time. Uh, it, it takes a while for the city as a governmental entity to sell property and go through that process. We've done that recently uh, through Public Works with a few uh, processes, and it's just a time-consuming bureaucratic procedure that a government entity has to go through to sell. You then also have the risk of someone else coming in and wanting to purchase the property rather than the Children's Museum. And so I think their desire and interest is to go with what the game plan has been all along that we've got a really good track record for uh, and documentation to support and that we've had the Oversight Board approve in the past. And so it's nothing new for them to look at. They're just continuing forward with something they had already recommended before. I see. A very, very high priority for our community. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to pass along some public kudos to Paul Casey for having been the guy that rang the bell early on this issue. And, and if we had been uh, later in that, we might be further in the weeds on this and not be where we are today. So uh, well done on that level. Um, but, Mr. Casey, would you um, – I know that with the, the, the city lots, uh, the PBIA, PBIA issue came into play in helping us qualify those for governmental use. The depot lots, first of all, the configuration of parcels as they relate to the Enterprise Fish uh, Company, the, the depot lots themselves, and of course at the Children's Museum across the track. Is that when you talk about the four parcels, does that encompass all of those? Or that, is that, are, how is that chopped up? And, and then what is the, the strategy in terms of our qualifying that? Because there's not a PBIA down there, but there, what is the, how are we going to justify our retaining those properties? Madam Mayor and Councilmember Rouse, just to clarify for everyone, one of the, the reason the state said you can transfer the parking lots that I have up on the screen was because we have the parking benefit uh, improvement assessment area, uh, which is essentially our partnership with the businesses uh, to help fund the 75-minute free and the ongoing operational support to keep our rate structure low. And the state kind of hung their hat on that argument. We gave them a lot of different reasons why we thought they were governmental purpose, but the state hung their hat on that and said, 
okay, that's been in place since 1971, uh, prior to redevelopment agency forming, and uh, we think that's the reason it's a governmental purpose. And I, I think strategically from their part, they want to withhold their ability to look at parking lots throughout the rest of the state, uh, and so they kind of cut us loose on that. So then we go down to the railroad depot area and the Fish Enterprise lot, and your question is a good one because we don't have the PBIA established below the freeway, and so we don't have that argument going forward. We think we've got a lot of other arguments, though. Uh, the railroad depot uh, and the surrounding parking lots, including the Children's Museum site, is comprised of numerous parcels. I can't think off the top of my head. It might be 11 or 12 parcels. And so four of those parcels are where the Children's Museum is going to go. So we're going to deal with those with the argument that I laid out just in the prior question with the history on the Children's Museum. The remaining parcels, and I'll exclude the Fish Enterprise Company lot for now, our argument there is going to be they serve a transportation, a coordinated transportation purpose uh, in that part of town. It is the Amtrak station that is now a national landmark that was purchased for governmental purpose, for transportation purposes, that we used Proposition 116 money from the state to help rehabilitate and acquire, uh, and those funds are used for uh, you know transportation purposes, and that the surrounding parking lots support the railroad depot and the general area as providing a transportation purpose. And then the one building, the REA building, where Greyhound is located, was part of our multimodal approach of getting uh, all the different transportation facilities down in that area. So we're hanging our hat on all those with the transportation argument that is a governmental purpose that they have kind of given us the nod and say that's a good argument that is going to carry the day with us. We'll lump the Enterprise Fish Company in with that as well. We actually acquired the Enterprise Fish Company later on after the freeway project went through. Uh, but the idea and plan is to kind of integrate that lot into the railroad depot property area as well. And so we're, we're confident that they'll go along with that. And um, I, I remember a few years back that we actually did anticipating the end of the RDA transfer much of this to a successor agency back when. So was that voided essentially by this process and we're doing it again or what, how exactly does that work? Yeah, we're essentially doing that now. Um, it was always our idea when the redevelopment agency was going to expire in 2015 that we'd transfer these assets to the city. Uh, then when this whole legislation started coming about, we tried to transfer it to the city just to kind of cover our bases, and they kind of voided that action and said, that was premature, you can't do that. Uh, but now we're going through the official process, we're getting the approval, and so today you are finally transferring these 12 parking lots, uh, and then we'll have to go through the property management plan and return to council with the formal action to transfer these remaining properties as well. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Hotchkiss? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, this, without question, is a major feather in your cap, Madam Mayor, and Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Casey, and Mr. Wiley. Oh, what a powerful team to go up there. I had no doubt, honestly, I didn't tell you this, but I had no doubt if anybody was going to win this argument, it was going to be you all. Mr. Williams, too, it's great that he was there. So, united front. Um, quick question. The properties that you were considering putting on the block, if we don't get a bid, because it's not in anybody's real interest to own those, because they're not going to get anything out of them, do will they revert to us? Do we take them over? What, any thoughts on how we'd handle that? It's a good question, Mr. Hodgkiss. I, I, Madam Mayor, Mr. Hodgkiss, Caius Caesar Chavez has value. That's M1 property in the industrial zone that has, you know, a 0.05% vacancy rate, and there's a demand for industrial space in Santa Barbara. So I have no question that there will be interest in purchasing the Calle Cesar Chavez property. Uh, Paseo Nuevo will be interesting, and I think that's where we're just going to have to think strategically that maybe the simplest and cleanest way is for us to put a bid on it and have the city just buy it at a relatively very modest, cheap amount. Well, for that's sure, we want to keep that. control of that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Back on Paseo Nuevo, just for the listening public, um, nothing will change. Paseo Nuevo is not closing. It, you know, so it's not like what we were concerned about with the parking lots. This is just a lot of bureaucratic kind of paperwork of ownership because the city owns, or the RDA, I guess, owns the land underneath the stores, but not the stores. I mean, can, you, can we yeah, Mr. assure the public about <laughs> Paseo Nuevo? <laughs> yes, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> the Paseo Nuevo development was a redevelopment, city redevelopment project in the 1980s, and in February of 1989, we closed escrow, and essentially there are three parcels there, Nordstrom, 
what was formerly a Broadway parcel, Carter, Holly, Hale, now Macy's, and then the middle parcel, the mall itself. Three parcels, all three of those were on 75-year leases, and as I say, the escrow closed in 1989. They actually rounded it up the 75 years to start in 1990, so that lease does not expire until roughly 2064. And so nothing's going to change until 2064, you know, legally. Uh, but the city is technically, the redevelopment agency, rather, is technically the landlord. Now the successor agency is the landlord of that land. And, um, you know, to say that we would sell off that landlord's reversionary interest is, is one thing. Uh, and that's apparently what the state law is telling us we're, we may have to do, or at least run it through a plan. But it's going to be complicated because there are a lot of strings <clears throat> uh, involved. Uh, for example, there was a sharing of PBIA. The, the San Nuevo pays PBIA, and the, one of the original terms of the, uh, the lease was that they, they would pay their PBIA up to a certain level, and then the city would pay it into the parking fund thereafter. So I'm not sure, any, for example, anyone would want to buy this reversionary interest knowing that they're going to have to pay PBIA. Well, at the same time, all the rent was prepaid in 1989. We got $3 million from Nordstrom, $3 million from Carter Holy Hale, and about $9.7 million for the mall, <clears throat> all prepaid rent. And no one pays us rent and hasn't since 1989 and won't at all Lease under this up. lease. It was mm -hmm. prepaid rent. So. I'm not sure why anyone would want to bid on something like that. And there's other complications that I could get into that would just be major question marks for anyone be, to really bid on a property like that. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, well, first off, I'm so relieved I, and I, I, that we don't have to have a big fight because it was going to be a big fight. Uh, there were a lot of people who were ready to step up, and I really want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, everyone from the downtown organization, the Chamber of Commerce, the Conference and Visitors Bureau, the Restaurant and Lodging Association, and then individuals all over the place who um, during December when you're going from holiday party to holiday party, because that's when this issue came up, that was the topic of conversation. It wasn't about what do you want for Christmas, it was what's happening to the parking lots. And so um, they were ready, you know, to go. And I told them, let's just see what they say, and if we need to turn on the spigot, um, we're ready. So that is a big relief that we don't have to do that. So that's um, very good timing and uh, very, very good news. So that was uh, great, great to see. And uh, kudos to the staff on really the, the, not only the detailed analysis and the arguments made in writing, but the um, going up to Sacramento. I mean, it was, I think, I think we obviously Made, made a difference, so that was great. Um, the Children's Museum, I have two questions. What is the timing and how expedited can that timing be for the management plan? Because I know they're waiting with bated breath to get moving and finish their capital campaign in terms of the Children's Museum. And the second one is how, um, I know there's an MOU between, as you mentioned, between the city and the Children's Museum about a lease, but is the actual lease finished or is that something that still needs to happen and can that happen concurrently? So if you can answer those questions. Madam Mayor and Council Members, we're going to work expeditiously on getting this property management plan, A, to benefit the Children's Museum, but also because we think that we had the Department of Finance's attention, so we want to get these back in front of them while they still might remember their commitments to us. And so we want to move this as quickly as possible. It's a little bit of a bureaucracy of the hoops we got to go through and all the backup and supporting material we have to do on each and every parcel. Uh, so when we talk about the railroad depot, we're really talking about 10 or 11 different parcels that we have to do this thorough background analysis. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but not a lot of time. The Children's Museum has been asking me for a date of when we're going to be at the Oversight Board, and it's too soon, but we've already had a, kind of an all-hands meeting on Friday. We've made assignments out to staff. We're getting on this right now, and we're going to put it together as quickly as we can, and when we're ready, we're going to get it in front of the Oversight Board and up to the State Department of Finance. Your second question, uh, we do not have a lease negotiated with the Children's Museum yet, but we did talk to them on Friday as well, and we've committed to starting those negotiations up again now so that they can go concurrently. I, we have a confidence level at this point that we're going to get these properties transferred, so let's go ahead and spend the time and get the lease uh, teed up and ready to go so that when that transfer is effectuated, we're that further down the road so that they can begin construction. So we're working with them to make that happen. Great. 
Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. Wiley. And I'd also point out, you know, the, the concept here is a ground lease for a dollar right. a year. That's a very simple lease. Can you, the, we Essentially, the city says, this is yours for 50 years. We don't want to get sued over it. It's you defend and indemnify <coughs> us. You pay us a dollar a year. and, and But it's a very simple lease. It shouldn't be hard to, okay. to do. Good. But, That's good to hear. Okay. Mr. House. Maybe we should get that money up front. Yes. <laughs> that dollar? <laughs> 50 bucks? 50 dollars. Well, actually, I, one thing that we didn't say out loud, and I think it, uh, for those who are watching or um, for those who are reporting, um, why is this such a great big deal? I mean, the downtown parking lots are part of the magic of, of the beautiful downtown Santa Barbara. The fact that people can park their cars once and get out and, and benefit from walking in the, the gorgeous uh, State Street Plaza and the surrounding streets and all the businesses, depending on those low, on that low um, parking fee that we have, and um, that if it were to go into private hands, the chances are that those costs would go up because they'd have to bear all the burdens of running them in that particular way. And, and all those infrastructure things, ah, it's just, but for the public, this is really, really, really important. And uh, for all those businesses too. So I move that we, um, that we adopt recommendations A and B in the staff report today. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Good news. Council committee assignment reports. Ms. Maria. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I attended the Joint Cities County Affordable Housing Task Force um, last week, and I was um, reappointed vice chair, and Galita uh, Council Member Paula Perotti is the chair. And our planning commissioner, uh, John Campanella, um, initiated a discussion about economic development related to housing, um, jobs created through construction, and also how the, the need for housing for workers uh, in particular. I also attended the um, South Coast Task Force on Youth Gangs, which I just say gang task force, um, and there was a great panel discussion that, um, including the service providers, so the, all the um, agencies and nonprofits and community groups um, <clears throat> that provide youth services. And I just want to say I have a lot of faith in that process going forward, and I was really pleased to be there and be part of it. Um, and on a lighter note, I attended the Housing Authority's barbecue. It was a retirement for Roberta Mascianti. I think I'm saying her name right. And um, uh, she was the facilities person and did a great job. So I just wanted to, to do a little shout-out to her. And then my other little shout-out is to... Carol Bennett, who brought us matzo ball soup today. Um, Just One Soup is her group, and she sells it and raises money for good causes. And, you know, the, the soup of my people is menudo, but I do have enough worldliness that I know a good matzo ball soup. Um, and that was really good. So um, my thanks to her for feeding me my lunch. <laughs> Thank there you. we go. Uh, Mr. Francisco. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Last Tuesday, Councilmember Hotchkiss and I attended the 105th birthday party of Edith Kirkmeyer, a volunteer at Direct Relief International, which is a great organization, which, as you know, uh, ships free medical supplies all over the world. Uh, and all I can say is what a, what a wonderful spirit that woman has, and she, she is very inspiring to be around. Uh, <clears throat> On a somewhat more pedestrian but still important note, uh, the ABR, because of the Martin Luther King holiday, met on Tuesday instead of Monday and heard um, a presentation concerning the long uh, gestating Sandman Inn project, which has been changed now. Uh, the idea that they're coming back to the Planning Commission with is no underground parking. And though that has some disadvantages, the advantage it has is that they're providing a great deal more uh, landscaping and open space and on the original project. So got favorable comments from ABR. Good. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This past Saturday, the downtown organization held their annual retreat and uh, was a very uh, positive and upbeat uh, for, uh, it was actually kind of rather unique. It was really upbeat about uh, the state of things and the direction of things. Mr. Armstrong made a, uh, a detailed presentation on our finances, our projects, and the political uh, scenario we have today, and it was all, almost, almost kind of a love fest. Everybody was very appreciative of Mr. Armstrong's and his uh, efforts, along with our police, to uh, 
make a safe and secure uh, and very successful uh, film festival that we're enjoying right now. Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just to add one thing about uh, Youth Kirkmeyer, I went to sh shake her hand, you know, and it's fairly, I wouldn't say frail looking, but 105 is 105. She had a hand of steel. I mean, it was impressive. And uh, she was just about to take her driving test. So on behalf of all of, on behalf of, all of you, I wished her good luck. She was worried about not making it through the written. I think she had one answer wrong, and she was fretting about that. Um, along with Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Rouse, I went to the Milpas Community Association retreat, where we discussed, this, discussed a business improvement district there. Thanks to your input, it was really helpful. They are interested in that. Haven't gone, known uh, whether they're going forward with that or not. Um, let's see, what else should I tell you about here? Uh, the Lodging and Restaurant uh, Association had a membership meeting at uh, the Bacara, uh, where Mr. Armstrong delivered the news about that you uh, we all endorse today about our parking lots, et cetera. And um, anything else I want to fill you in on? I really can't see. I've got so much stuff here. Trust for Historic Preservation had their... I think it was their 50th year celebration annual meeting on Saturday. Um, Mr. Francisco was there. I was there. What, what a great place to have a meeting in the chapel. It's like, wow, in the middle of history. Anyway, that's what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Mr. House? It's been really a busy uh, couple of weeks, actually. The Martin Luther King Day, of course, was just phenomenal and uh, really well organized and um, uh, beautiful to see everybody come out on a beautiful day. and celebrate that special space. Um, also on the heels of the Tibetan uh, visit, uh, people from Tibet actually coming here, to Tibetan society here in Santa Barbara and also from San Francisco and um, the Bay Area uh, um, and up in Northern California, we had representatives here and they gave us a beautiful, um, as, as we were proclaiming and appreciating them and declaring Tibetan week, uh, Tibetan Culture Week, they gave us a beautiful um, little memento of their visit and what a, what a really remarkable opportunity and thank you Madam Mayor for letting me represent you while you're out of town for that. Um, along with uh, these other retreats, the Restaurant and Lodging Association had their gathering and, and, and Mr. Armstrong made his presentation. Conference and Visitors Bureau and the Film Commission had their annual summit that was uh, really charting the course for the future um, here. And they, they've been so incredibly successful. And the, the energy between the Downtown Organization, the Conference and Visitors Bureau, the Restaurant Lodging Association, all these groups, all I can say is you can't help but be optimistic. The enthusiasm uh, for Santa Barbara and their part in it and their active engagement is just really remarkable. So truly kudos to each one of those organizations for having a very active membership and strong boards. And that's it. Thank you. Well, as mentioned, uh, I was out of town part of the time since our last meeting due to some family member uh, uh, family issues and also attending the U.S. Conference of Mayors winter meeting, which was an excellent conference, as it always is. Uh, they had a record number of members of the administration's cabinet there, uh, not just a representative, but the actual Secretary of Labor, Secretary of uh, Commerce, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of Transportation, I mean, you name it. They, they were there pre presenting on one thing or another. Uh, the Vice President spoke um, to the group uh, on during a luncheon. It was, um, his entire hour talk was about the gun control, um, the gun violence prevention package that was just released out the day before. A lot of the conversation was about prevention of uh, gun violence in, in the nation, a lot of conversations about that. But also there was, um, I met the new U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness Executive Director who oversees uh, the administration's process dealing with um, homelessness and, and housing in the community. Um, also uh, Lisa Jackson from the near almost departing uh, EPA director was there and there was a session with her um, and meant, uh, issues related to the cultural economy which is something I know we we care about quite a bit the mayor of New Orleans is the chair of that committee so he New Orleans knows how to throw a party and how to make money doing the same thing so it's good to uh, learn from learn from other cities uh, so it was an excellent program I have a lot of stuff I brought back with me and uh, as Mr. Armstrong knows, he's been sending a lot of emails saying, what about this idea? What about that idea? Um, and uh, also on a smaller note, a lot of things were already mentioned. Uh, last Friday, I also went to the San Marcan. They, You may know they um, have approval and they're in the midst of 
uh, providing a new community center on their campus at the San Marcan Retirement Community, their life center, they're calling it. And it was an old um, maintenance facility. And uh, the board for the national, uh, I think it's the Covenant Retirement Community, of which San Marcan's one of, I think, 12 in the country, they had their board meeting, which was why they had the celebration while they were there. And the president of that committee said that Santa Barbara is the only one of their properties in the country that's actually uh, developing new prop, new new buildings. They're actually constructing new buildings. So I think that attests to the strength of that particular uh, facility and um, to Santa Barbara in a lot of ways. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit. So yes, a lot going on, and thank you all for covering for me for various things. But it's fun doing those those things as well. Okay, uh, we went through item six, but there are still a couple of closed session items to read. Item 7, conference with labor negotiator. Item 8, conference with legal counsel regarding pending litigation. And item 9, conference with legal counsel regarding pending litigation. Okay, and I think we're not going to do item 8, the pending litigation. There's nothing to report afterwards, so we'll adjourn from closed session.